Hey. Did, did, he, did he say he has a girlfriend? Wow, that's re- very good. Well, hey, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you, ever, have you ever been a witness to a crime um, and you had to give a description of the suspect to the police, so they bring in an artist, and then they, they, uh, you have to give them the description, and they draw a composite of, of the suspect, uh, it's kind of a sketch. And I'm always amazed at how uh, well they, they, these artists are and how, how good that they are, that they can, they can draw these things just based on the description. So I want to show you just a couple of composites that, that have helped police catch their man. Here's the first one right here. This, uh, believe it or not, this was a sketch that was drawn by an artist at a, at a police station in Bolivia. All right, Bolivia, so maybe that's why it kind of looks like that. But you know what, any idea who this, what, who this is? Any idea? I mean, I knew, when I saw this picture, I knew exactly who the suspect was. I mean, I, immediately, right? It was this guy right here. It's like, the, <laughs> piece of cake, right? It was just very, very clear. Um, what about this one? This, this second sketch was drawn by police in Sacramento. Believe it or not, this one right here was drawn by police in Sacramento of a suspect. I'm not sure what they did or what this person did. But any idea who this is? Again, what did you say? Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber. You know what? That's exactly what I thought. Doesn't it look like Justin? See, Regina thinks it was Justin Bieber too. But I don't think Justin Bieber was doing, you know, and doing anything bad. Let me give you one more. That's really good. I did, not, I did not tell her to say that. This one right here. This person was uh, arrested for murdering her daughter-in-law in a Target parking lot. True story. And I said her um, daughter-in-law. Uh, and the reason why the, the funny hair and the mustache is because she, she wore a wig and a mustache during the commission of the crime. And police eventually arrested and convicted this woman, Joanna Hayes, for the murder of her daughter-in-law. This is amazing. You know, for the last couple of months, we've been in this series, I think going on eight weeks now, we've been in this series called Who is God? Who is God? And we've been trying to wrap our heads around who God is. We're trying to get an understanding of who he is. And, and so I want to ask you this. Based on what you've learned these last eight weeks, based on what you know about who God is, I want to ask you this. What, if you were to come up with a sketch, a composite drawing of who God is, what would it look like? Right? What would it look like? Now, I realize that it's impossible. You cannot draw a sketch or a picture of God because God is spirit. So it's not impossible. It's not possible to do that. So let me ask it this way. If you could choose just one word, if you had to choose just one word that sums up who God is, what word would you choose? What word would you choose? Now, remember what we learned so far. Let me just kind of give you a little review, okay? And I think this will be helpful to you. But we, we, we learned that God is Elohim, that he is the creator of the universe, that he is Yahweh, that he is self-existent, that he is always, has always been and will always be. We learn that he is good, that he is uh, sovereign. He rules over all. We learn that he is father to us, that he is Abba Father, that he is daddy. We learn that he's really, really, really big, bigger than the universe he created, and we learn that he's holy. So if you had to choose only one word to describe who God is, which word would you choose? I think the word that I would choose is the word glorious, because I believe that glory is the summation of all of God's attributes, all of his nature, all of his character. It is his glory. Let me just show you just two verses. Uh, And by the way, you have a Baywatch, and all your verses are listed there for you. Uh, Hope you brought your Bible, uh, or you can look at the screen. But these verses are not in your notes. These verses will only be on the screen here. But Exodus 24, 17 speaks of the glory of God, and it says this, Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top, on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. All right? So the glory of God is described as being like a devouring fire. I mean, just this consuming fire. And then here's another description of the glory of God, Ezekiel 10, verse 4. And it says, And the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub, the cherub would be an angel, went up from the cherub to the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. So here, the glory of God is likened to a cloud, and it is brilliant, and it is all-consuming. It fills the courtyard. It fills the house. So here's God. Here's what we know about God. God is glorious. He's like a devouring fire. He's radiant. He's all-consuming. He is the creator of the universe. He is self-existent. He is good. He is sovereign. He is big. He is holy. 
And it begs the question, how can we possibly stand before a God like that? If God is all those things, I mean, how can we stand in front of him? Why would God have anything to do with us if that's how he is and who he is? How can we possibly enter into his presence? And that, that question reminded me of a scene that comes from the Wizard of Oz. When Dorothy, the Tin Man, the Scarecrow, and the Cowardly Lion uh, go to the Emerald City to see the wizard. Remember that scene? And it's, I found a little clip of it. It's, it's, kind of an, it's a very old clip, but take a look at this. It's pretty funny. Wait a minute, fellas. I was just thinking, I really don't want to see the wizard this much. I better wait for you outside. What's the matter? Oh, he's just as scared again. Don't you know the wizard's going to give you some courage? I'd be too scared to ask him for it. Well, then we'll ask him for you. I'd sooner wait outside. Why? Why? Because I'm still scared. <laughs> What happened? Somebody pulled my tail. <laughs> you did it yourself. I... Uh, he, oh. Come on. Come forward! Tell me when it's over. Look at that. Look at that! <laughs> I want to go home. I am Oz, the great and powerful. Who are you? I just love that scene. It's like like shaking like this, right? Can you imagine? That? I love that scene. But um, they were terrified, right? They were terrified of the wizard's glory, the fire, the image, the smoke, all of that, and the, and the noise. Uh, and, but it was just smoke and mirrors, right? It was all smoke and mirrors. And the, the wizard's glory was nothing, and it is nothing compared to the glory of God. And so how can we come before this glorious God, this holy God, this awesome God? How can we come before him? Well, today I want to tell you about another one of God's attributes, and that is his grace, God is gracious. And this one is absolutely critical for us. It is absolutely critical because without God's grace and without him being gracious, it would be impossible for us to stand before him. I mean, we, we, we wouldn't stand a chance before him. We would be toast before him if it weren't for his grace. So if you brought your Bible and when you turn to Exodus chapter 34 or look at your bay watch, look at the notes. And before we dive in, let me just uh, open up our time in a word of prayer. Dear, glorious, awesome, mighty God, there is no one like you. And it, is, it, it absolutely amazes me, Father, that we can come into your presence. It, it, it amazes me that you would be mindful of us, that you would love us, that you would care about little old people like us. And it is only because of your grace, this attribute that we want to look at today. And, and this morning I ask God, I beg that that your grace, that, that just for this brief moment, you would show us your grace, that we would be touched by your grace, that we would be drawn to you by your grace, and that you would help us to understand it in a, in a clear way than we ever have before. God, you are, you are, you are awesome. You are, you are incredible. And I, I pray that today you would speak to each and every one of us. So thank you, God. I ask that you would bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when Moses ascended on the Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, he said something to, to Moses. God, God said something to Moses that was absolutely extraordinary. And I want to show it to you. Exodus chapter 34, verse 5. That's the first verse there. Um, this was amazing. And it says here, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there on Mount Sinai and proclaimed the name of the Lord. All right, I want you to do this. I want you to circle the first two words, the Lord. And then underline the last six words, proclaim the name of the Lord. If you connect them together, what this is saying is the Lord proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now that's kind of a, 
kind of an odd statement if you think about it. The, the Lord proclaimed the name of the Lord. It's an unusual statement. But what, all that this was really saying was God gave us his name. God proclaimed his name so that you would know what his name was. But basically it was like God gave us his name. It's like if I go out in the lobby today and I meet you the first time, I'm going to stick out my hand and I say, hi, I'm Gary. That's, that's basically what this was. This was kind of a self-revelation. God was saying, I'm going to reveal myself to you. I, he proclaimed his name. Now, as you might recall, I'm going to just give you a little bit of review, and I want you to stay with me because you've heard this before. So if you're new, this will be new to you, but uh, if, if, you, if you've been here, you've heard this before, but it, I'm kind of going someplace different with this, so I want you to follow along with me. But you might recall that the first time Moses met God or encountered God was in the burning bush, 30, 31 chapters earlier in, in Exodus chapter 3. And, and at that time, when Moses asked God what was his name, Moses replied, or God replied in this way, when Moses asked God what was his name, he replied, replied this way, Exodus 3, verse 14, put it up here for you, it's on your notes, God said to Moses, I am who I am, and he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent uh, me to you, All right, so when Moses asked God his name, God replied, very early on, he replied, I am who I am, and we learned that I am is the Hebrew word ayeh, and it means to be or to exist. So God basically said, my name is I am, or I, my name is I exist, or my name is um, I am, who I am. That's basically what he said, right? And then in the very next verse, again, this is our review, but stay with me. In the very next verse, uh, verse 15, it says, God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. And again, the word Lord there, the Lord, the God of your fathers. Again, we, um, maybe you want to circle that. But from this passage, we learn that one of God's names is Yahweh. And that's the word Lord here. Uh, so circle that. It is Yahweh. Now remember, again, this is review, that according to he Hebrew tradition, God's name was so holy that it was never to be spoken or written of. And so when the Hebrew scriptures were written, when the Old Testament was written, God's name was never spelled out. In fact, four, instead, four Hebrew letters were chosen to represent God's name. In English, the letters would be Y-H-W-H, and it was pronounced Yahweh. And for us who have English Bibles, those four letters were always translated L-O-R-D, all caps, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And that's what we see here in verse 15, the Lord God, right? So if I were to read it to you uh, kind of in the Hebrew translation, it would be this. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, etc., etc., etc. Now, what this doesn't tell us is who Yahweh is, or it doesn't tell us what he's like. All it says is this is his name, Yahweh. Right? It doesn't tell us um, who he's like. What we know is that these are four Hebrew letters, and it's pronounced Yahweh, and in our English Bible, it is pronounced, or it is, uh, pronounced Lord, L-O-R-D, all caps. But what does Yahweh actually mean? Now go back to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34, I'll start in verse 5. We just read this. But it says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So God says, here's my name. Right? Verse 6, here it is. The Lord passed before him, passed before Moses, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So what did Yahweh proclaim? He says, I'm going to proclaim my name. What did he proclaim in verse 6? He proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord. Would you just circle that? Circle the Lord, the Lord, or Yahweh, 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 Yahweh. He proclaimed, I'm Yahweh, Yahweh. And then, get this, this is so amazing. Right after that, he tells us who Yahweh is. Who is Yahweh? Well, Yahweh is, Yahweh is a God merciful and gracious. See the verse right there, verse 6? A God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So I want you to do this. Grab a pen and I want you to circle in your Bibles or on your notes there. Circle the word merciful. God is merciful. Circle the word gracious. Circle slow to anger. Circle love and faithfulness. And circle uh, forgiving iniquity, all right? Circle those things. Now, when it comes to the first one, God is uh, the Lord, the Lord, a God, merciful and gracious. Circle gracious 
10 times. Circle just a whole bunch of times because that's the one that I really want to key in on today. All right? Circle it a bunch of times. Now, let me take you through these one at a time, and I'm going to start with the word gracious. All right? And you can write this one down. The Lord is gracious. All right? The Lord is gracious. Probably, you probably know what the definition of grace is, right? You, you know the definition of grace. The, the definition of grace is unmerited favor, right? Grace isn't saying a prayer before you eat, although we call that grace, but, but grace is unmerited favor. I'm going to give you an example of unmerited favor in action, grace in action. In October 1989, this man, East German communist dictator Eric uh, Honecker, was forced to resign when his government, the East German, German government, completely collapsed. Honecker was hated by his people he, because he was the man who erected the Berlin Wall around the city, keeping everybody out and keeping everybody in. They hated him for this. He perpetrated human rights abuses against his own people. He persecuted the Christian church in East Germany, and he was blamed for the deaths of hundreds of people. And so we went, when he was forced to resign, resign, everybody was happy. Everybody rejoiced. And when he left office, he didn't have a single friend in the entire country. The only friend that he had was his wife, Margot. And he found himself, he was in poor health, he was jobless, and he was homeless. He left the, the presidential palace, he had nowhere to go. Because he was so despised, no one in the country was willing to rent him a room. No one was willing to sell him a house. He had nowhere to live. And so, until a Lutheran minister named Uwe Homer, this man right here, decided to take him in. Uvi Homer, Pastor Uvi Homer, opened up his home to Honecker and his wife, and he allowed, allowed these two to come and live in his home. Even though Honecker, it was his wall that prevented the pastor from going to see his dad when he died in East Germany. He wouldn't let him, he wouldn't let him go. He wouldn't let him go, right, or, or in West Germany. It was Honecker's persecution of Christians that kept all of Uwe, Uwe Homer's uh, children out of college. They couldn't attend college. They weren't allowed to attend college because they were Christians. So they were rejected every single time. It was this Honecker that made that possible. And so despite what Honecker did, all these things that he did, the pastor opened his home up to him and let him come and live in his home. You see, this is what grace is. Grace bestows blessings on those who don't deserve it. That's called unmerited favor. It bestows blessings on those who don't deserve it. That's what Homer did. Homer, Honecker didn't deserve a place to live. He didn't, he didn't deserve it. He didn't do anything. In fact, he did the opposite, but Homer took him in, and that's grace. Grace bestows blessing on those who don't deserve it. And that's who our God is. God is a God of grace. He restores, bestows blessings on us even though we don't deserve it. All right. Second thing is merciful. God is merciful. All right. You can write that one down. The Lord is merciful. What does that mean? Mercy is different from grace. Mercy is not punishing someone who deserves to be punished, right? Mercy is not punishing someone who deserves to be punished. There's a difference. Um, by now, all of you know who these three guys are. Leangelo Ball, Cody Riley, and Jalen Hill, who created an international incident when they went to ch China on a team trip with, with their UCLA basketball team, and they shoplifted a couple of very expensive items. They could have spent months, perhaps years, in a Chinese prison but the charges were dropped and they were let go. And they weren't punished for what they did. You see, they were shown mercy. That's mercy. Mercy is not receiving what you deserve. And now that they're at home, it has been interesting to watch some of the reaction of their fellow Americans, many of whom think that they be, should not be shown any mercy now that they're home, that maybe their, their uh, eyes ought to be gouged out, they ought to be burned at the stake or, or any of those things. And I've, I've actually seen some interesting comments from people in our own church about what should happen to these three individuals. What do you think? What should happen to these three individuals now that they're back, right? Fortunately for us, we have a God who is merciful, and he doesn't give us what we deserve. If we were to pay us what we deserve, we would all be dead, right? We would all be in big trouble. Again, mercy is not the same as grace. Mercy, mercy can be seen in an act of grace. It's there, but it's not the same. You know, recently I went to uh, Costco with my wife. You've, I've told you this before. We usually go every Sunday after church. I hope, I'm hoping that we don't go today because it's going to be really crazy because Thanksgiving is on Thursday. But we used to go up uh, after church on, on Sunday, and it's always crowded, always crowded, and, um, and it's always hard to find a parking space. So rather than keep driving around, I decided one time, this last time I went there, I'm just going to pull myself in the arm, I'm just going to wait, 
right? So that's what I did. I, you, know, you know what it's like, right? This is crazy. So many people. So I just pulled into an aisle, and I just waited for, for the next shopper to come out. So finally see the shopper in the distance. Here she comes. She's pushing her cart, and she comes to the car, and I go, oh, this is, I'm going to get a spot. So she, she's right there, and I'm right here. I'm waiting, and she, gets, she goes to her car, opens the trunk, and she unloads, the, you know, the toilet paper and the rotisserie chicken and, and the things that you get at Costco, right? And so, and then she put the cart back and, you know, and then she went to her car, the driver's side, she opened it up and she got inside and she sat down and I go, so I put my blinker on, my signal on to let everyone know that I'm going to park right here and I'm waiting for her to come out. Like, well, 30 seconds pass. Like, okay. Uh, A minute passes. It's like two minutes pass. Three minutes pass. I'm thinking, why? Is she having a problem starting her car? Does she need a jump? What's going on here? Right. Five minutes pass, and I'm thinking, what is wrong with this woman, right? What is her problem? Let's get, let's get going, lady. And like, what's, what's, what's the problem here? So, and I thought, what do I do? I mean, I know she saw me. She knows I was there because she went right by me. But I mean, she's just sitting in her car. I don't know if she's doing her nails or eating a Costco hot dog or whatever it is she's doing. Or play, maybe she's playing a game on, on, um, on her phone. I don't know what it is. And, you know, finally, I'm thinking, what do I do? What do I do? Do I, do, I, do I go? Do I just leave? If I leave, I know what's going to happen. As soon as I leave, she's going to pull out, right? <laughs> no, I'm going to wait another minute. And, I, and, then, you know, before, and she might just sit there, might sit there for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So I think, I'll be here forever. So you know what I did? I left. I just left. As soon as I left, what did she do? She pulled out. <laughs> I was so mad. I was so mad. And, and Cheryl said to me, calm down. She says, you're so impatient. And I said, you're right, I am. <laughs> I am so impatient. You know, the, the third way that God described himself to Moses was by saying that he was slow to anger, right? He's patient. You can write that one down. The Lord is patient. The Lord is patient. And, and I found a great definition uh, recently of patience, and it's this. It's patience is waiting without complaint. Isn't that good? Patience is waiting without complaint. That's God. He waits without complaint, meaning his buttons aren't easily pushed. When you try to push them all the time. He doesn't let us have it every time we do something dumb. He puts up with us. He's not easily upset like I am in a Costco parking lot. Like he's merciful. All right. Just like, and just like, just like mercy, patience, you know, can be seen in every act of grace. But he is merciful and he is patient. So, and patience is not grace, but it is a characteristic of grace. All right. It's not grace, but it's a characteristic of grace. You know, yesterday or Friday, um, we had a funeral here. We said goodbye to a very special man. His name is uh, Noble Oya. He passed away at the age of uh, 94, and his son Lee and uh, Lee's uh, wife Lorraine have been attending, just starting to attend our church. But Noble was a businessman here in Torrance, a very successful businessman, and his uh, favorite restaurant was Hometown Buffet. And he worked right across the street from Hometown Buffet. Um, his offices were there. And, so, and he was a very generous man, very generous man. And, and he would take his employees there for lunch because that was his favorite place to eat. Now, he, he loved that place. He just loved the food there. So, right? In fact, during one stretch, he took his employees to Hometown Buffet for 17 days straight. 17 days straight. And he loved it. He can go the rest of his life there. But his workers, they hated it. They hated, like after, after a week, right, after a couple of days, like you got to try something else, right? But he loved it because it was a buffet, right? And so he took him there, and again, he treated. And so when Christmas came, his workers and all of his friends, what do you think they got him? What do you think, what do you give, get a guy who's, you know, who's fairly well off? What do you, they got him hometown buffet gift cards, Right? Not $25 gift cards, but according to his son Lee, they gave him $50 gift cards and $100 gift cards and $200 gift cards to Hometown Buffet. And he was so happy. He was so happy. After Christmas, Lee said that he was sitting at his desk and he got all the gift cards. And he was like, look at Lee. Look at what I got. Look at what I got. And he was so excited as he ran his fingers through all these Hometown Buffet gift cards. And you know what Noble, Noble did with all those gift cards? After Christmas, he used it to take all of his employees back to Hometown Buffet for the next couple of months, probably. You know, this story, this, this story reminds me of the fourth description that God uh, gives us as to who his name is. It's found in verse 6, and it says he abounds. 
and steadfast love and faithfulness. He abounds. I mean, he's just got so much of it. You know, this word abounds conjures up the image of something that's inexhaustible, like Noble's gift cards, except that his gift cards aren't, inexhaust, or aren't, aren't uh, inexhaustible. They're exhaustible, right? They run out at some point. But God's love never runs out. God's love is inexhaustible. God's faithfulness are inexhaustible together. God, it just goes on and on. Remember uh, Psalm 103, verse 11. It says, for high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. Remember this, we, couple, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. How high are the heavens? I mean, there are th three, four levels of heaven. It just goes on and on and on and on and on and on. There's no, there's no limit, right? There's no end to it. It just goes on and on. And how high the heaven is, that's how, that's how high God's love is for us. That's how great God's love is for us. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's steadfast love for those who fear him. And it's amazing. So write this one down. The Lord is loving. The Lord is loving, right? In, in fact, in Exodus 34, verse 7, verse 7, it says that God keeps his steadfast love for thousands. Notice that? He keeps his steadfast love for thousands. And that word thousands does not refer to the number of people. He keeps his steadfast love to all these thousands of people. That's not what that means, right? This, this thousands refers to generations. So it speaks of the longevity of God's love. In other words, it doesn't just last for a thousand generations, but it lasts for thousands upon thousands upon thousands. In other words, it just goes on forever. God's love just goes on forever and ever and ever. And God's love... I want you to understand this. Is not, it, love is not grace, but love is the motivation for grace. Love is why there is grace. God, love is why God gives us grace and why he shows us grace. It's why he is gracious, right? So it abounds just like, uh, just like those gift cards. It abounds, right? Verse 6 also says that God abounds in faithfulness. He abounds in faithfulness. And this refers to God's dependability or reliability. So you can write that one down. The Lord is faithful. And just like the others, God's faithfulness is not grace, but his faithfulness is a characteristic of God's grace. It's, it's a trait of God. It's a quality of God's grace that it is faithful. And finally, Yahweh, the Lord, is forgiving. It is forgiving. You can write that one down. Yahweh, it says here, forgives transgressions, iniquities, and sins. And, and again, forgiveness is not grace, but forgiveness is the reward of grace, that we are forgiven and we allow, we're allowed to enter into his presence. And so, let me recap this for you. When God appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai and he said, this is my name. What is your name? Yahweh, Yahweh. Who is Yahweh? He is merciful, gracious, patient, loving, faithful, and forgiving. That's who Yahweh is. And the focal point of all of this is his grace, that God is gracious. In fact, Zondervan's NIV commentary says this, God's grace is explicated or clarified. God's grace is clarified by his mercy, by his patience, his love, his faithfulness, and his forgiveness. God is gracious. And it is because of his amazing grace that you and I are allowed to stand in his presence. It's only because of his grace that we can stand before a glorious, holy, awesome powerful God. I want to close by showing you an incredible story of God's grace in action that comes from the Bible. So I want you to turn to Ezra chapter 9 in the Old Testament. Ezra chapter 9. Ezra, if you're wondering where Ezra is, it comes after 1 Samuel, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, then there's Ezra, right? And then right after Ezra is Nehemiah, Esther, and Job, and then Psalms. So it's kind of right there in the middle of all these. But let me give you the back, back story first uh, before, we, before I show you the actual verses. But Ezra chapter 9, roughly, in roughly 586 B.C., the Babylonians, led by King Nebuchadnezzar, invaded Judah and the city of Jerusalem. Now, we, now we can put that up here, 2 Kings 25. Here's what it says, and this one is not in your notes, but right on the screen. It says, in the ninth year of his reign, when he was king for nine years, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And you jump down to verse 9, it says, And he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and every great house he burned down. In other words, he, he, he besieged Jerusalem, attacked Jerusalem with he and all of his army, his forces, and they destroyed everything in sight there in Judah, in Jerusalem, including the temple of God including the temple of God, burn, verse 9, burn the house of the Lord down, burn it down, burn down the king's palace, burn down all the homes there. They killed a lot of Jews, and whoever was left, whoever wasn't killed, they took them as hostages. They took them as hostages, and they deported 
them to Babylon. Babylon, in case you're wondering, is where Iraq is located today, present-day Iraq. It's where Babylon is. And it was a very dark time for the Hebrews, a very dark time for the Jews, as they, were, as they lost everything, their, their homeland was destroyed, and they were all taken captive. Imagine if that happened to us, right? If, if everything that we had was just burned down, looted, destroyed, and we're all taken captive. We're all put in chains, and we're all taken away. That's what happened to them. It was a very dark time for them because now they had to survive in a foreign land. And the Jews, according to the scriptures, were held captive in Babylon for 70 years, nearly two generations, for 70 years. And finally, after 70 years, they were allowed to, to return home. And they returned home back to Judah, back to Jerusalem in waves, in three different waves or three different groups. The first, Jew, group of, the first wave of Jews, the first group of Jews that returned back to, to Jerusalem, it was led by King Zer, or Zerubbabel, they, they focused on rebuilding the temple because the temple was destroyed. And that was, that was where they would make sacrifices to God and worship God, and they would pray to God. And so they wanted to rebuild the temple first. So they rebuilt the temple. And then Ezra was part of the second wave of Jews that returned back to Judah. And Ezra, who wrote this, was, was a teacher, and he was also a priest. So you can only imagine when Ezra, it was his, his turn to go back to Jerusalem. He was so excited, like, I'm finally coming home. I'm finally coming home. And he was excited, but that excitement was quickly dashed because when he returned home, that's when he learned that his people, including many of the priests, the Jewish priests, and some of the leaders had taken, they had taken these pagan wives. They had taken these pagan wives. And they had begun, in other words, they had begun to intermarry with non-Jews, contrary to God's command not to do so. And this was not, a, on God's part, this was not a race issue. This was a spiritual issue. Because God knew that if the Jews intermarried with non-Jews, they would be drawn away from him. He knew that would happen. And that's why he commanded the Jews never to intermarry, not to intermarry in the first place. In fact, you look at Deuteronomy 7, verse 3 and 4. It says, you shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Okay, so this was, this was not a race issue. This was a spiritual issue. And when Ezra returned home, this is exactly what he found, that his own people, including some of the leaders in the temple, had disobeyed God, and they began to intermarry, and they married pagans, and, that, and those pagans drew them away from the Lord their God. And again, I just want to say something about this. This scripture does not say that you may not intermarry with someone else who is not of your race. Right, that God is not opposed to marrying for, to you or anybody else marrying someone outside of your race. Right? That's not what, but he is opposed, God is opposed to you marrying someone who doesn't share your spiritual values, who doesn't believe in Christ as you do. That, that, that's what he's opposed to. And that's why it says that, that we need to be equally yoked, equally yoked with the person that we get married to. Now, if you're already married to somebody, who is not a believer, then you stay married to them and you stay faithful to them and you do the very best you can to stay strong in your faith and not be led astray, but you stay strong in your faith and you try to be the one to influence your spouse to come to church and come to know Christ. That, that's what you do. You, you stay with it, right? But if, if you're a single, do not marry, do not, the scriptures say do not marry someone who doesn't share the same Christian values that you do. All right, so that's a little side thing. Well, Ezra comes back, he sees the situation, and it absolutely broke his heart. Take a look at Ezra chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, and it just says this. Now, when these things had been completed, the princes approached me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands according to their abominations, those of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has intermingled with the peoples of the lands. Indeed, the, the hands of the princes and the rulers have been foremost in this unfaithfulness. And so Ezra was absolutely crushed by what he came home to, that the people, that the leaders, that the Levites and even the priests began to intermingle and intermarry, they were beginning to be drawn away from the Lord their God, and he was crushed. And here, this is what I want to get to, all right? Here was Ezra's response to that, all right? Take a look at verse 3. He wrote, when I heard about this matter, I tore my garment and my robe, and pulled some of the hair from my head and my beard, and I sat down appalled. 
I was just appalled and I, and I pulled the hair out of my head and pulled the hair out of my, my beard. And then verse five, it says, but at the evening offering, I arose from my humiliation, even with my garment and my robe torn. And I fell on my knees and I stretched out my hands to the Lord my God and I said, oh my God, I am ashamed and embarrassed to lift up my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have arisen above our heads and our guilt has grown even to the heavens. You see, when Ezra discovered what his people had done, that led to him praying perhaps the most heart-rending prayer ever recorded in the Bible. Ezra tore his clothes pulled his hair, fell to his knees, stretched out his arms and cried, I am ashamed and embarrassed to lift up my face before you, my God. And it wasn't even his sin. It wasn't him that had intermarried. It was the sins of others. And he came and he confessed it. He owned it as if it was his offense. And he prayed this incredible prayer some say it is one of the greatest prayers of confession found in the Bible. And this prayer, this prayer of confession tells us a lot about Ezra, does, Ezra, doesn't it? It tells us about how much he loved his holy God and how much he cherished his glory and his holiness. It conveys to us how much he hated sin and how, how broken he was over it. Let me ask you something. Have you ever confessed your sins to God like Ezra did? Have you ever confessed your sins to God in this manner? Because you were so broken over your sin that all you, all you could do is come before God and, and fall on your knees and stretch out your hands and cry out to him and say, God, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed to even look upon your face because of what I've done. Do you pull out your hair? You know, if I, I've sinned so much in my life, if I pulled out all my hair for all the sins, I wouldn't have any hair left, right? And I, don't think, I think we'd all be bald. You know, I wish I could tell you that I, this is how I confess my sins. I wish I could tell you, but I can't because I don't. And I think the problem is we, we have become desensitized to sin. We're, we're desensitized to sin. We see sin on TV and in the news, and, and it's like, it doesn't bother us anymore. We, we, we see porn, and we just, it doesn't bother us. We lie, and it doesn't bother us. We, we get angry in the parking lot, and even, we don't even think about it. And God hates that when we act like that, when I act like that. We become desensitized to sin so that it doesn't break our hearts. It doesn't cause us to weep. It doesn't, it, it, and it, it doesn't cause us to for our hearts to be broken, and it should. It should because sin breaks God's heart. And sin causes God to weep. And what is sin? I mean, it's like it's all of it, right? It's selfishness, and it's pride, and it's ego, and it's lust, and it's greed, and it's hate. It's anger, and it's resentment, and it's jealousy, and it's murder, and it's lying, and it's stealing, and it's cheating. It is gossiping. It is backbiting. It is criticizing. It is talking back. It is putting people down. It is drunkenness. It is adultery, and on and on and on. And all of it offends God. Little ones and big ones. It all offends God, a holy God. And that takes us back to grace. Because if it wasn't for grace, none of us, none of us would be able to stand before this holy God. And I love what Ezra said right after this prayer of confession. I love what he said. Take a look at verse 8. But now, for a brief moment, grace. Isn't that good? But now, for a brief moment, grace has been shown from the Lord our God, Lord Yahweh, to leave us an escaped remnant, to give us a peg in his holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our bondage. This is so good. Church, this is so good. Would you underline grace has been shown? 
right? Grace has been shown. And for what purpose has grace been shown? What purpose? We're right there in the middle of verse 8. It tells us to give us a peg in his holy place. To give us a peg in his holy place. Will you circle that word peg? This is the Hebrew word yated, and it means nail. It means nail. And back in the day, a, a yated could often be a very large nail and was pounded in the wall of a home. I mean, it, you, you hit the stud and it is secure. And it's secure enough and strong enough that you can hang anything on it. And this nail has been hammered into this holy place is what this is saying. This peg, in other words, provides security. It provides security in this holy place. And that's why the ESV translation, I'll put it, right for, uh, put it up here right underneath the NASB. And I wanted to use the NASB, the New American Standard Version for, for Ezra 9. I just love the NASB, how it, how it describes it. And, and just FYI, the NASB, the New American Standard Version Bible, is a, is a solid and fantastic uh, translation if you want to use it. We, I use the ESV, which is excellent as well, but... The ESV says, same verse says, but now for a brief moment, favor, instead of grace, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a, not a peg, but a secure hold within his holy place. God, has, his grace has given you a secure hold in his holy place. He's given you a nail. And, and what was the holy place? The holy place that Ezra was, ref, that Ezra was referring to is probably the temple of God, which had been rebuilt. <clears throat> but, but in a general sense, in a general sense for all of us, I think the holy place refers to, to God's presence, to heaven, right? In, in other words, Ezra said that for a brief moment, here, here the people have sinned. They disobeyed God. They're, they're, they're beginning to intermarry, intermarry and draw, draw themselves away from the Lord. And Ezra says, and then in the midst of all that, this Ezra says, but for a brief moment, God has shown us grace. He's shown us grace. Why? So that you would have a secure place in his presence. In other words, God is a forgiving God. God is a, a gracious God. God is a, a loving God. God is a faithful God, even when we sin against him. You see, and that's why without grace, without this grace, we couldn't stand uh, in, in his presence. And I, lo I love this passage because it's so unique, it's so different, because this is what God did for us. This is what God did for us. For a brief moment, God has shown us grace. He has given us a peg, a secure place, and that peg is Jesus. It is Jesus, and we know, and we know from the Scriptures that Jesus was the embodiment of God's grace. John 1, John 1, 14, and the Word refers to God, and the Word became flesh became human, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Right? So we know that Jesus came, and He was the embodiment of grace, full of grace, full of truth, because He was God incarnate in human flesh. And we also know that Jesus took the pegs the nails, he was crucified, John 19, 18, for they crucified him with two others, one on one side and with Jesus uh, in between them. And thus, I believe that Jesus is the peg and the holy place. He was nailed ac across by three pegs, by three large nails, one in each hand and one in his feet. Jesus is our peg. He is our security. He is your salvation. He is your hope. He, he, is the, he is why God is gracious. And He is why you and I can stand in the presence of God even though we're stained with sin through and through. Jesus is our peg. The only question is, have you made Him your peg? Have you made Him your peg? I hope you will if you haven't already. Because without Jesus, you will never be able to stand before a holy God. And I just want to say to you, God's grace is available for everyone, but it's not for everyone. 
You don't receive God's grace. You don't, you're not the recipient of God's grace until you do what Ezra did. And that you confess your sins and you come before God and you say to him, God, I'm ashamed at what I have done. I'm ashamed. I can't even look at your face. But I know you've given me a peg, a secure place in heaven because you allowed your son to be crucified on a cross with three pegs. And his blood was shed that my sins might be clean. I believe in your son. I receive your son into my life. I give you my life, God. And it is only then that the totality of God's grace comes upon you and you have a secure place in heaven. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Jesus is the peg. He is how we can even stand in the presence of God. But the real question is, have you made him your peg? Have you received God's grace? It is there for the asking, for the taking, but have you received it? Without it, you can't stand in God's presence. You're too sinful. I'm too sinful. But Christ died on a cross to save us, to cleanse us, to forgive us. Today, will you give your heart to Christ, will you say to him, will you surrender your life to him and, and come to him and say, God, I, I confess I am a sinner. And I sin and I sin and I sin. And today I want your amazing grace in my life. I believe that Jesus was your son, that he is my peg, that he died on a cross for my sins. Today, I surrender my life to Jesus. Forgive me of my sins, past, present, and all the ones that I will commit in the future. Save me by your amazing grace, that all my chains might be broken, that all my sin might be washed clean, and I might become the, the person you want me to be. Will you say those things to him? Oh, I hope you will. Oh, Father. Yahweh, Elohim. Almighty, glorious God. There's no one like you. And we thank you for who you are and we thank you for all of your attributes, but I thank you most of all for, for grace because if it wasn't for your grace, we couldn't even have a relationship with you. We couldn't even talk to you as we talk to you today. Thank you, God, for sending your son to die on a cross for our sins. All of our sins, all of our filth, all of our dirt, all of our ugliness, you have washed away. And you allow us to enter in your presence. God, we thank you. We thank you. Receive us, God. And we run to you every day, God. Help us to run to you every day because we sin every day. And God, I pray that you would, would renew in every one of us a, a greater sense of who you are and a greater sense of our own sinfulness so that when we come before you, we will weep and our hearts will break because of our sins and because of who you are. Thank you for your amazing grace.